Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to chapter 10. In this chapter, we're going to be concentrating in on the behavior of substances in the gas phase. So we're going to talk about things that we see in the behavior of gases that's common to all gases. Okay, so we're not going to be talking about chemical behaviors, we're going to be talking about physical behaviors of things in the gas phase. Now, there are several macro scale properties of a gas that we're going to talk about. We're going to be talking about pressure, volume, temperature, and sample size. And talk about sample size, we're usually going to be talking about how many moles of gas particles we have. Now, to explain the physical behaviors or substances in the gas phase, we're going to start with something called the kinetic molecular theory. Okay? The kinetic molecular theory is based on a lot of experimentation and observations. And remember, a theory is an overarching explanation about why things are the way they are. Why do things behave the way they behave? In this case, why does the gas, something in the gas phase, have these physical properties? Okay? Gases, then, we can think of as being made up of tiny particles, atoms or molecules, that are in constant motion. The particles move in straight lines until they collide with each other or the walls of the container they're in. When particles collide, a transfer of energy occurs. Now, there are three basic postulates, three basic points to the kinetic molecular theory. One is that the size of the particles is very small compared to the size of the container they're in. So we can assume that their volume is negligible. It's like looking at one raindrop in Lake Erie. Okay? Uh, one raindrop is, is negligible. Okay? So we consider the particles in the gas phase to be point masses. The kinetic energy of the particles is proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. The higher the temperature, the higher the average kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is related to temperature, or you can say that temperature is an indication of the kinetic energy of the particles on the atomic level. So how much energy do they have? How much motion do they have? Okay? Kinetic energy can be calculated as one half the mass times the volume squared. Not volume, excuse me, velocity squared. So kinetic energy, Ke, is equal to one half mv squared where v is velocity. So the higher, the faster the particles are moving, the higher the kinetic energy, the higher the temperature. So on average, when you increase the temperature, you increase the speed at which the particles are moving. Okay? Now, notice it talks about average. Average kinetic energy, average temperature. Average speed. So let's talk about our third point here, is that collisions of one particle with another particle or the wall of the container are considered to be completely elastic. Now, what do we mean by completely elastic? This is not talking about the stuff that holds up your underwear or right now is holding on your mask, okay? Elastic in chemistry and physics means that there is conservation of mechanical energy and conservation of momentum. So if I look at the potential energy and the kinetic energy right before collision and the potential and kinetic energy right after collision, they're going to be equal to each other. The momentum right before collision, the momentum right after collision are equal to each other. The kinetic energy theory was born out of observations of the behavior of gas samples. Um, and so we're gonna start talking about some of these observations that were made, okay? To understand the study of the gas sample, First thing we need to understand is pressure. Pressure is force, F, divided by area. 
okay? Force per unit area. Now, ladies, you've experienced this because we've all worn high heels, pointy stiletto heels at some point in our life. Guys, I'm pretty sure you haven't, but maybe you have. Um, if you're wearing stilettos and you walk across the soggy yard, you sink. And the guy standing next to you that's in the sensible shoes doesn't, and you know he weighs more than you do, and you get disgusted because he didn't sink and you did. And the reason is pressure. Because all of your body weight is over something that's maybe a quarter inch by a quarter inch. So think about force divided by area. All of his body weight is over something that's about two inches by two inches. He's producing less pressure on the gap ground. Now ladies, this can work to your advantage, okay? If you ever need to get away from an assailant and you're wearing those high heels, strip them off. Take one of them, pull it back, and whack them in the middle of the head with the heel. That's going to supply a lot of pressure, and you can actually embed a high heel in the head that way. Or if you don't have time to take your shoes off, if you will come down with that high heel and put all of your weight on it, on the little toe, it'll break it. And the, breaking the little toe is supposed to be very painful, and it gives you an op the other opportunity to get away. Now guys, if you're planning on telling a girl something that's going to make her really mad and she's wearing high heels, I suggest that you wear steel toe boots, or you make sure you're far enough away until she can't get your toes. Okay? So let's remember that pressure is force divided by area. Now, a gas, for gas, pressure is the result of constant collisions between the particles that make up the gas and um, the walls of the container. So you're looking at summing up all the collisions over all of the surface area in the container at a time. Now, if we go up in the Earth's atmosphere, you move into regions where there are fewer and fewer particles. So as you move up through the Earth's atmosphere, the pressure gets lower. So the atmospheric pressure, top of Mount Everest, is different than the atmospheric pressure here in Tuscaloosa, which is pretty close to sea level. This is why on an airplane flight, your ears pop. Or if you're driving up into the mountains, your ears pop. Okay? The units for pressure, that we're going to encounter are the millimeter of mercury, which is also sometimes called the tor, which is the height of a column of mercury um, supported by the atmosphere. Okay, One millimeter of mercury is also called one tor. We'll also commonly use the atmosphere. The atmosphere, ATM, not automatic teller machine, atmosphere, is the average pressure at sea level above one square meter of earth. One atmosphere is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. That's the same as 760 torr. Now, in physics, okay, I quite often use pascals, which is a newton per meter squared. I'm not gonna really use it in here, but I did want to bring it up so that you would be aware that there is another unit. And you also encountered PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, that's an English unit. We're not gonna use that one, okay? Scroll on down. Now there's a table 10.1 that's got all of those um, units on it. So don't panic. Okay, the only things I expect you to know is the relationship between atmospheres and millimeters of mercury and millimeters of mercury and tor. So let's talk gas laws. Remember, a law is just a statement of fact, and it doesn't have an explanation why, it just says, this is it, okay? Boyle's law, we're looking at things happening under conditions of constant temperature and constant sample size. So you have a trapped sample of gas in a piston. Turns out that if you increase the pressure, you decrease the volume. And if you decrease the pressure, you increase the volume. 
This is referred to as an inverse relationship. In an inverse relationship, okay, it says that volume here is proportional to 1 over pressure. So its volume is equal to something times 1 over pressure. So I can see if pressure goes up, the value of the volume is going to have to go down. The pressure of the volume goes down, the value of the volume is going to go up. Okay, we can rewrite this and say for a single trapped gas sample, pressure 1 times volume 1, which you started with, would have to equal pressure 2 times volume 2. So let's do a really simple problem, 10.2 on page 422 in your textbook. Okay, we're given in this problem that, let me read it to you and then we'll walk through it, 10.2. The problem reads... Okay. A snorkeler takes a syringe filled with 16 milliliters of air from the surface where the pressure is one atmosphere okay, to an unknown depth. The volume of the air in the syringe at this depth is 7.5 milliliters. What is the pressure at this depth? Well, if I use P1V1 equals P2V2, we were one atmosphere up at the top of the water and we had a volume of 16 milliliters. We're at a new depth where we got a pressure P2 and a volume of 7.5 milliliters. Notice that I didn't have to change these to liters because I have volume units that match. So if I solve this, I get 2.1 atmospheres. So there was a change of 1.1 atmospheres. Okay? So the book then also tells us that if the pressure changes by one atmosphere for every 10 additional feet, I can take that 1.1 change times 10 meters for every one atmosphere and say they're down 11 meters. So more than 33 feet. Okay, so that's Boyle's Law. Next is Charles's Law. Under conditions of constant sample size and pressure, as temperature goes up, volume goes up. This is referred to as a direct relationship. Whatever happens with temperature, the same thing happens with volume. Okay. Now here's some graphs of Charles's data. He had three different sample sizes. Okay. One mole, and he started at one atmosphere half a mole at one atmosphere, a quarter mole at one atmosphere, and he was decreasing the temperature. Okay? Everything started out at 500 degrees C, 773 Kelvin. And as he brought the temperature down, notice that as temperature comes down, the independent variable, the volume comes down. Okay? Now, one of the neat things that Charles did is he extended these lines. In math, we call that extrapolation. And what he noticed is, no matter what his size sample are, was, the lines all met at a single point, at minus 273.15 degrees C. So at that temperature, the volume for his extrapolated lines goes to zero. Okay? And what Charles got out of this, okay, actually what a friend of his got out of it, this that was looking at his data is that there was a limit to how cold things could be. This is where we get the concept of absolute zero from. And the scale that sets our zero point at minus 273.15 is the Kelvin scale. Okay, Zero degrees Kelvin. His friend was Lord Kelvin. Now, out of Charles's experiment, we get the Kelvin temperature scale, and hint, all gas problems are worked in the Kelvin temperature scale because there are no negative temperatures in the Kelvin scale. And we get volume one over temperature one has to equal volume two over temperature two. And the temperature always has to be in Kelvin. Okay? Now, let's look at problem 10.3. 10.3 says a gas in a cylinder with a movable piston has an initial volume of 88.2 milliliters. 
If you heat the gas from 35 degrees C to 155 degrees C, what is going to be the final volume in milliliters? Now, since both volumes are going to be in milliliters, I don't have to worry about changing units, but I do need to figure out my temperature in Kelvin. So, temperature in Celsius is 35. To get temperature in Kelvin, I just add 273.15 to it. So the 35 degrees C is 308 K, and our final temperature is 155 C. If I add 273 to that, I get 428 K. So if we solve it for the new volume, the new volume is 123 milliliters. Okay? So you can see as temperature went up, volume went up. Now let's talk Avogadro's Law. Now this is a newbie on the block. This one is a um, relatively new law. As in, this one wasn't in the textbooks when I took chemistry. Okay? So it says, under conditions of constant temperature and pressure, volume of a gas sample increases as the number of gas molecules increases. Now, guys, you've all experienced this. You put one puff of air into a balloon and then two puffs of air into a balloon, three puffs of air in the balloon. The balloon gets bigger. The volume increases. So this is a direct relationship. At a given temperature, if you increase the number of gas particles in a chamber, okay, at a constant pressure, so let's say in a piston, the volume's going to increase. So we can say V1 over, it should be N1, I made a typo. This should be V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. That should be N1, okay? I made a typo, guys. So I'm pointing it out to you. Let's scroll on up. So let's look at problem 10.4. It says, a chemical reaction occurring in a cylinder equipped with a movable piston produces 0.621 moles of gaseous product. If the container contains 0 0.120 moles of gas before the reaction and has an initial volume of 2.18 liters, what is the volume after the reaction? It says assume that the pressure and temperature are constant and that the initial amount of gas completely reacts. Okay? So if I look at this, I started out with a volume of 2.18 liters and we had 0 0.120 moles of gas to begin with. Now that reacts, so it's all gone, and I'm left with 0.621 moles after the reaction, so I want to solve for V2. So N1 over, I mean V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2, I solve for N2, I get 11.3 liters. These are plug and chug problems. Now, if we take Charles's law and Boyle's law and Avogadro's law and we combine them, we get what's called the ideal gas law, okay? If we combine them, we get the ideal gas law, which is PV equals NRT. Your book goes through the derivation of the ideal gas law from Boyle's law, Charles' law, and Avogadro's law, so I'm not gonna do that, especially in this format. Okay, P stands for pressure, V for volume, N is number of moles, T is temperature, we got a new symbol in there, capital R. R is referred to as the gas constant. Now the gas constant is 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin. As long as pressure is in atmospheres, this is what R is. If I were to change to Pascal's, it would change the um, the units and it'll actually change the numerical value. But this value of R, you gotta know, okay? So let's look at problem 10.5. It says an 8.5 liter tire contains 0.552 moles of gas at a temperature of 307, I mean 305K. What is the pressure in atmospheres of the gas in the tire? Well, Using PV equals NRT, pressure I don't know. We know the volume was given to us as 8.50 liters. We were told that we had 0.552 moles. 
There's the gas constant, 0.0821, and the temperature, 300 K. So look here, Kelvin and Kelvin divide out, moles and moles divide out, liters and liters divide out. The only unit we're gonna be left in is atmospheres. So it turns out the pressure here is 1.63 atmospheres. Okay? Now, let's look at problem 10.6. Ten dot six says what volume does a 0.556 mole sample of gas occupy at a pressure of 715 millimeters of mercury and a temperature of 58 degrees C. So the first thing that I'm going to have to do is go from millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. So 715 millimeters of mercury times one atmosphere over 760 millimeters of mercury. Remember that slash line tells us that that's on the bottom, it's in the denominator, so I'm going to divide by it. So that's 0.941 atmospheres. Okay, and to get the temperature in Kelvin, I'm just going to add 273 to 58, and that's where the 331 comes from. So PV equals NRT, 0.941 atmospheres times the volume has to equal 0.556 moles times 0.0821 liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin times 331K. Solve it. We get a volume of 16.1 liters. Okay, again, it's another plug and chug. Now, density, which is mass divided by volume of gas, is related to the pressure and the volume of the gas sample. If we rearrange the ideal gas law, okay, what we can find, what we can do is say that density equals pressure times molar mass over RT, or playing with it a little bit more, we can say that molar mass is equal to the mass of the sample times R times T over PV. Now guys, this is important because this gives us a way to determine the molar mass of a substance without knowing what the formula for the substance is. Okay, so we're gonna look at problem 10.8 on page 433. So if we look at problem 10.8, it says a sample of gas has a mass of 827 milligrams. Its volume is 0 0.270 liters at a temperature of 88 degrees C and a pressure of 975 millimeters of mercury find the molar mass. Well, I'm going to have to convert milligrams to grams. So 827 milligrams is 0.827 grams. Okay, the temperature is in degree C. I need it in Kelvin. I add 273 to it. That's where the 361K comes from. And we were told that the pressure was 975 millimeters of mercury. I have to divide by 760 millimeters of mercury to get the pressure, 1.09 atmospheres, and the volume is given to us in the correct units. So once I have everything in the correct units, I just plug it into my molar mass equation, 0.827 grams times 0.8. 0,821 liters atmospheres over moles Kelvin times 361 divided by 1.09 atmospheres divided by 0 0.270 liters and we get the molar mass is 83.3 grams per mole. Because notice atmospheres, atmospheres divide out, liters, liters divide out, Kelvin and Kelvin divides out, you're just left in grams per mole. Now it's time to talk Dalton, okay? Dalton's law of partial pressures. Dalton, Dalton was a keen observer of nature and he loved weather forecasting, okay? And so that's how he got into playing with pressure. And he thought a lot about mixed samples of gas. And what Dalton was able to realize is that pressure is due to those collisions of particles with the walls of the container. And because of that, each type of particle in there, each individual particle is contributing to the overall pressure. 
So if you kind of added up all of the pressures, all the collisions for particles type 1 with particles type 2, you got the total pressure. So he said that the pressure exerted by each type of gas would be called the partial pressure. And the sum of the partial pressures must sum up to the total pressure of the system. Okay? So he said total pressure is partial pressure from particle type 1 plus partial pressure for particle type 2 plus partial pressure for particle type 3 for every how many different kinds of gas molecules you have, gas particles. Okay? Scroll down. Okay. Now, mole fraction X is the moles of substance A over total moles of particles. So X is moles divided by total moles. Turns out that partial pressure is equal to mole fraction times total pressure. So let's look at problem 10.10, .10, okay, on page 437. So if we look at problem 10.10 .10 on 437, it says a diver breathes a heliox mixture of oxygen mole fraction 0 0.050. What must be the total pressure for the partial pressure of oxygen to be 0.21 atmospheres? So we're told that the partial pressure of oxygen we need is 0.21 atmospheres, and we're told the mole fraction X is 0 0.050 when we want the total pressure. We solve for total pressure, it's 4.2 atmospheres. Again, plug and chuck. Okay? Now, in problem 10.11, it says a common way to make hydrogen gas in a laboratory is to place a metal such as zinc in hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid reacts with the metal to produce hydrogen gas, which is then collected over water. So suppose a student carries out this reaction and collects a total of 154.4 milliliters of gas at a pressure of 742 millimeters of mercury at a temperature of 25 degrees C. What mass of hydrogen gas in millimeters I mean, in milligrams, does the student collect? Now, if you look on page 438 in your textbook, it talks about water vapor. When we collect something like hydrogen over water, there's going to be some water ma vapor mixed in with our hydrogen gas. And at 25 degrees C, the partial pressure of water vapor is 23.78 millimeters of mercury. Okay? No. So our total pressure is 742 millimeters of mercury. Our partial pressure of water is 23.78 millimeters of mercury. So the partial pressure of hydrogen is the difference between the two, 718 millimeters of mercury. Okay? If I then change it to atmospheres, 718 millimeters of mercury times one atmosphere over 760 millimeters of mercury. And that shouldn't be a slash there, it just should be millimeters of mercury. Let's fix that. So the partial uh, pressure for hydrogen is 0.945 atmospheres. Our volume was 154.4 milliliters, so that's 0.1544 liters. Temperature 25 degrees C is 298K. If we now use PV equals nRT, solve it for N, N equals PV over RT, plug everything in, okay? N is 2.56 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydrogen. Now the problem asks us for the mass in hydrogen. So 5.96 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydrogen times 2.0158 grams per mole gives us 0 0.0120 grams of hydrogen. Now it asks for that in milligrams. I wouldn't go that far in a test, so don't worry about it. Okay. All right, 
temperature and molecular velocities. At the beginning of this lecture, I told you that temperature was related to average kinetic energy, which means it's related to average vol velocity of the particles. Now, one of the things I want you to notice here that kinetic energy depends also on mass. Particles of different size, if they have the different uh, have a different mass, they have the same kinetic energy. They're going to have different velocities on average. The faster the particles are moving, the oh, faster particle. Oh, no, no, no. Let me rephrase this. Let's look at this graph. All of these are graphs of the distribution of velocities of particles all at the same temperature. Okay. I want you to notice that the average velocity of a hydrogen is much higher than the average velocity of an oxygen molecule. And that's because to have the same kinetic energy, because hydrogen weighs a lot less, it has to be moving faster than the oxygen molecules. So in the room with us right now, we have oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules and some carbon dioxide molecules and some hydrogen molecules, some helium molecules. The hydrogen molecules are moving much faster on average than the nitrogen molecules. The nitrogen molecules are moving a little bit faster on average than the oxygen molecules. Okay? Now, let's talk effusion and defusion. Effusion is a process of a gas escaping a container. So think about a um, helium balloon. You buy a helium balloon, you know that over time that balloon's going to go flat. It just starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller and it stops floating. Or if you just blew up a balloon with your own breath and you left it sitting there, you know over time it'll shrivel up. And that's due to effusion. Even though the surface of the balloon looks like it's solid, for any individual molecules, there are pathways through the balloon. Okay? And that's effusion. Diffusion is a process of one gas moving through another. So if you, somebody, let's say, um, my mother back in the day loved Chanel number no. five and she would almost take a bath in that stuff. And when she would spray it, you know, and I would be at the other end of the house, it would come out and slap me in the face. That's diffusion. Those particles moved through the air. Because of the fact that smaller particles move on average faster than larger particles, smaller particles effuse and defuse faster. Okay? And it's related to their molar mass. I can say that the rate at which A diffuses divided by the rate at which B diffuses equals the square root of the molar mass of B divided by the molar mass of A. Now, I'm not going to do any calculations with that. It just seems like a, an add-on calculation. I just want you to understand that smaller particles effuse and defuse faster. Now, the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. And the kinetic molecular theory is based on an ideal perfect gas, which means that all the collisions are perfectly elastic and that the, the volume of the particles is infinitesimally small and doesn't matter, and essentially that the particles aren't sticky. Hopefully at this point you know that molecules are sticky because most molecules are slightly polar and even if they aren't polar, they uh, become polar momentarily when they get too close together. So molecules are sticky. So real gases can deviate from ideal behavior. If the volume of the container is small enough until the volume of the particles becomes important, we have deviation from ideal behavior. If the particles are moving slow enough when they collide, there is a deviation from ideal behavior. To get a real gas to behave like an ideal gas, you've got to have it at low pressures and high temperatures. Okay? 
So here's what an ideal gas volume would be at 25 degrees C. Here, no, zero degrees C, excuse me. Here's what chlorines is. Notice it's a little bit less. It's a little sticky. Carbon dioxide, a little bit less. Ammonia, almost smack on. Nitrogen, pretty close. Helium and hydrogen, really, really close because they're not that sticky, okay? Scroll up for me. So, argon, okay, that's what happens to its volume as pressure increases. Notice the ideal gas is down here. It's a deviation. And it has to do with the fact that it's a real gas, it has a real volume, it's really, you know, it has some stickiness to it. It has the ability to polarize. Okay, hold on. So for real gases to behave like an ideal gas, we need high temperatures, low pressures. And guys, that's the end of chapter 10. So you're ready to move on to chapter 11.